Good morning and welcome to worship with us at First Baptist Burnsville. If you're here in person or if you're attending online, we welcome you as a beloved child of God. A few announcements to call your attention to on the back of your worship guide. There's a new book study that begins today. <coughs> What is the Bible by Rob Bell? If you're interested in being a part of this book study, you can see Mike Orr or Kathy Brawley. Their information is listed on the back. And then next Sunday, we'll have communion celebration together. Be sure and bring your world hunger offering. And be sure and make plans to attend for this time to share in the elements together. You're a beloved child of God. If you're full of energy or if you're at the fumes, you're a beloved child of God. If you've done everything right this week, or if you've done nothing right this week, It doesn't matter who you are or where you've been or where you find yourself on life's journey. You are loved and you are welcome. Let us worship together. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the responsive call to worship in your bulletin. God of life, you are near to us as our breath. Touch our eyes that we may see you in one another. Open our ears that we may hear your voice in the cries of the oppressed. Enter our hearts that we may be filled with your love toward all people. Come, O oh God of life and breath and wholeness, be with us now. Show us the way to new life and grant us the courage to be people of your way. Amen. Would you pray with me? It's good to be together. And God, we're grateful for this space. You don't force us to enter this space. You just call us here. You call us here because we need one another. We need a place and a space where we can understand the great eternal truth that we've been reminded of this morning, that we are your beloved child. There's never been one person ever created that you don't love. And it is hard for us to wrap our hearts and minds around it. But here we are again finding ourselves here in this place because we yearn to hear it again and again and again. The gospel that we long and thirst for. You are here among us. All the evidence we need to feel and sense your presence is here. It's in the voice of a little child, the presence of a little one, the smile of a neighbor or friend in the pew beside us. 
It's in someone lighting a candle, saying a prayer, sharing a hug. For this is what it means to be your followers. People who desire to be love and light. Speak to us again and again this morning until the gospel reaches its way all the way through us. The truths we so long to hear. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Won't you please stand? And in your bulletin, are the words to blessed are they.
us pray. God, we, we know we don't take up offerings because you're poor, because you're pitiful, because you need money. We don't take up offerings to buy blessings, to punch a ticket into heaven. We share offerings because we believe that you are generous, that everything about you is giving and loving. And we don't always understand it. And so we practice on occasions like this. We practice being generous because it helps us to place our priorities in the right place. It's not in money or the kingdoms of the, this world. We practice generosity because we believe you are also generous. So help us as we practice this morning. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. to invite all the children to come forward with their time with Sue Lackey. up here. I need you right by me. I like you close. Oh, yeah, that's good. I have pockets. Yes, you do have pockets, and I like them a lot. Oh, there. Yeah. Good morning. All right. Got a house full this morning, don't we? Great. All right. 
So I have a question for you first thing. Who knows what a recipe is? Have you heard that word before? What's a recipe? It's something that you cook. Yeah, it's something that you cook. That's right. And um, it, it's a list of things. That's right. And most of the time, I've got so much here to fool with this morning. Let's see. Most of the time, they come, we look in books, don't we? And so we have these books. See this hope? That's recipe. Yeah. It's got a list of all those things in there. Yeah. And you gather all those things together and you make something to eat, right? So I thought maybe you'd help me this morning and we'd see how, how it works because I saw a recipe for a really nice, healthy snack. And I thought that, that you might like to help me mix it up. Would you do that? Okay. So... Let's see, here's something for you, and here's, uh-oh, here's something for, well, let hold, hold it, and you can help him if he needs it up. You want to help this hold? No, you rather she did? Okay. So the recipe has just three ingredients, uh, uh, three ingredients, kind of. It says uh, to mix some uh, peanuts or nuts of some kind and some pretzels. So I already have them. Oh, I like pretzels. Me too. And so, so I already have them in here, all right? And so we're going to add some other things to it. And so we're going to, it said something about check mix to give us a little sweet. So let's open that up. And you can just empty that in there if you want. Can you get some of that in there? Oh, yeah. That's looking good. Okay, and so then some raisins. That'll make it nice and healthy. And, uh, I thought I had it open. Try the other. There it comes. There it comes. Got it? Here we go. <laughs> oh, bless you. <laughs> you almost got our raisins. That's good. All right, you want to put those in here? I think raisins. You want to do it? I think raisins. Yeah. I think those need me. They didn't want to come out much, did they? Oh, there they are. Okay, we got them. Oh, I'm good at dropping them. Yeah. All right, so then the recipe just said one more thing. It just said stir it up. So you want to give it a little stir? Oh, I'm good at stirring. You're good at stirring. Okay, great. Okay, how about that? I'm good at helping my mom stir. Oh, you help your mom stir. Well, you're experienced. We like that. Oh, it looks like tornado. It does. <laughs> they want to stick together, don't they? Yeah. You want to stir it a little bit? Yeah. All right. So, so now we got a nice, healthy snack. And I'd love to share it with you right now, however... Maybe we better ask your parents if, or if it's okay, and you see me after, and I'll, and I'll give you, share it with you, okay? Will that be good? Now, the, the recipe, uh, the thing that I want to talk to you about today, about our Bible lesson, is kind of interesting, because it's sort of like a recipe, too. Yeah, so God give, Jesus gives us a list of things, and he says that, it's kind of like a recipe for a happy life. Whoa. Yeah. And so it's things that we need to be in order to have a happy life. And a lot of people have started calling those uh, be attitudes because it's a good attitude that we need to have to have a happy life. So let me just tell you about a couple of them. One of them is to be, to be um, mindful and to be thinking about others. So let's say that if you, uh, somebody had said uh, something to you and it wasn't very nice, and they came back and they said, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to say that, and you say, that's okay. We can be friends again. 
That's what Jesus wants us to do. And that's one of the things that the Beatitudes tell us to do. The other is about, suppose you see two people and they're kind of arguing. You can be what the, uh, they have the attitude of a peacemaker. And that's what one of the Beatitudes tells us to be too. So you go up to him and say, hey, look. A peacemaker, that's right. That, and you can say to them, let's just, why don't you two be friends? Because that's what Jesus wants us to do. So we have a whole recipe from him, a whole list of things that help us to have a happy life. So let's thank him for that right now. Okay. Father, we thank you so much that you have given us a wonderful thing, a wonderful list to help us to be the very best people that we can be. And we are so grateful. We pray in your name. Amen. Okay, thanks. The reading today is from Matthew 5, verses 1 to 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say, all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Thank <laughs> you.
thank you. That's worth coming to church for. If you don't get anything else, that was worth getting out of bed on a rainy, dreary Sunday. Because what I'm about to do is almost really impossible. Preach a 15-minute sermon, hopefully, on one of the greatest texts found in the entire Bible. And you can imagine that that's a daunting task to try to preach about 15 minutes on this wonderful text. It was up on the mountain that Matthew says that Jesus sat down because he had something important to share. And it was with his disciples about what it really means to be a follower. This is what it really means to be a disciple. This is what it really means to be a part of the kingdom. When we hear this kind of talk from Jesus, we know that he was contrasting another kingdom. Of course, the kingdom of Rome. And everything that Jesus said was in contrast to the Roman kingdom. It should be clearly understood that Jesus wasn't talking about the way things are in heaven, although that has been interpreted. Jesus has been mistaken for talking about heaven when he was talking about here. He was talking about now. And Jesus is dealing <clears throat> with the things with the way things are right now in this kingdom because he is trying to usher in a new way of living and being. And what a contrast it is. We yet we hear so much talk today about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. There are those who loudly and proudly proclaim that if you follow Jesus, you will develop a perfect theology. Sadly, a doctrine that often leads to places of superiority. You will hear some people proclaim that following Jesus, you develop a set of morals that leads you to a place that, that, that is beyond reproach. That you will become so holy that you will separate yourself from sinners. And then you'll become so good <clears throat> that you'll develop a list of who is in <clears throat> and who is out. I hear a lot of that. I'm sure you do too. But you listened this morning, didn't you? Closely to what Jesus said about what it means to follow him. You did not hear a sermon on doctrine. You did not hear any theology. I cannot find a list in the Beatitudes about who's superior and who is left out. Jesus turns the ways of Rome and a religion, yes, a religion that was in bed with the Roman Empire, he turns it 
upside down. I think it's true that a lot of us are tired of an American form of Christianity that lifts up a certain group of people based on externals, skin color, sexuality, uh, and the new one, political views, or something else that Jesus never says. Jesus never says that any of these things is what it takes to be a follower. No one ever uses these words of Jesus when making decisions about who's out and who's in the kingdom. Never are these words spoken. I love what Richard Rohr points out. He asks the question, why is it that no one wants to post these words of Jesus on the courtroom walls? Why, why doesn't anybody demand that the words of Jesus be posted in stone outside the courthouse. Then Rohr goes on to say, well then I realized that the eight beatitudes of Jesus would probably not be very good for war or any macho worldview. The wealthy, or our consumer economy. In one of her sermons, Barbara Brown Taylor tells how when she was little, she liked to stand on her head. She was a short child, and everything in the world seemed so tall and so boring to her, but she found that by standing on her head, she could liven things up a bit. Grass hung in front of her eyes like a green fringe. Trees grew down, not up. The sky was a blue lawn that went on forever. Her, sing, her swing set was no longer an A, but a V. At any moment, her house seemed in danger of falling off the yard. She liked standing on her head because she could see things in a new way. And even more because in a world where trees grew down and houses might fall up, anything seemed possible. And that sounds whole lot like Jesus in this text. Everything is upside down. There's a new way of seeing things. A few weeks ago, there was a certain four-year-old having a sleepover at our house. I was locked away in a bedroom. Now that doesn't always happen at my house. I was isolating myself because I had both the flu and COVID, which by the way, I would not recommend to you. Get one of them at a time. I got them both at the same time. I don't know how you do that. But this certain four-year-old was struggling to go to sleep that night. It was really understandable because the little four-year-old was, well, she was having some uncertain moments in her life with circumstances of her dad being in the hospital and her mother uh, traveling back and forth uh, to the hospital. And there's a new addition to the family there. And, that little boy that's now a part of that family likes to be near his mother. 
quite a bit. So it was understandable that this little four-year-old was having trouble going to sleep. Because there was a lot running through that four-year-old brain. So in the room next to me, I FaceTimed her on the phone and I read her a story entitled The Velveteen Rabbit. You probably know the story. It's a story of a stuffed toy rabbit wondering what to do when he is replaced by these sort of newfangled wind-up toys. The bunny, of course, was once lovely, but now is ragged. It's older. It's careworn. The velveteen rabbit has a moment of candor about this fear. And when talking to the skin horse, a toy that is older and much wiser than all the other toys, the skin horse explains that in the process of being loved, we're not diminished. We are becoming real. In that moment, the velveteen rabbit no longer feels like a forgotten stuffed rabbit. The velveteen rabbit feels like, well, that he's really alive. That he's real. The skin horse says to the velveteen rabbit these wonderful words. Real is not about how you are made. It happens to you. It might hurt. And it, it happens slowly over time. But when you are really, really loved, he become real. And isn't that the gospel to those who feel like they are coming apart at the seams? To all the people who feel forgotten, put on the shelf by systems, and people that like to raise up a few and step on the rest. Jesus calls us to stand on our heads. I thought that that perhaps could be one of the most spiritual things we do. Wouldn't it be great if we were young enough that we could spend the rest of our time together today getting up on our heads until enough blood rushes in until we are able to see things that we have never seen before. Kate Bowler <clears throat> writes about this in her book, Good Enough. She writes about the skin horse and the velveteen rabbit. She writes, this, as the skin horse explains, generally by the time you are real, most of your hair's been rubbed off. Some of us know about that, don't we? And your eyes drop out 
and you get loose in your joints and you get very shabby. But these things don't matter. Not at all. Because once you are real, you can't be ugly. Except to people who don't understand. Kate writes, our shabbiness might be unacceptable unacceptable to an Instagram world. After all, our culture conf uh, confuses glamour with beauty and wisdom with bylines. May we always know the difference. You know, by the way, as I read as I read the book to the certain four-year-old, by the time, well, by the time the Velveteen Rabbit had become real, the little four-year-old was sound asleep. So maybe we just need to stand on our heads until we can finally see things the way they really are. And Jesus was writing and saying these things to a culture, to people who were both tied up in kingdom and a religion where they just could not see things the way they really are. When we worry that we are coming, becoming undone or that we are not as lovely as we were before, may we not be confused. I think it's true, don't you? That no one God has ever made, God has never made anyone who is ugly, except to people who just don't understand. Won't you please stand and turn in your hymnal to hymn number 613. And let us sing the servant song.
Pray with me. And we have witnessed over the years how your word has been so abused, used as a weapon to step on the very people that you lift up in this upside down kingdom of yours. And so we come humbly asking you, help us to stand on our heads. Help us to keep standing on our heads until we can see things the way you see them. 